After great introductions like that, in our tradition, we generally pass the collection plate. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Gerald, I have reserved that for the end. Oh, <laughs> Tonight, I feel, uh, I, I didn't know what to expect because we said we're going to open it up and then the first question comes and she was so articulate in that and then wanting an answer. And it's interesting for me, of all of these years, I slept under a mosquito net in Nigeria from 1964 until 1966. It's also interesting that as I left Joe, Nigeria in 1966, I was recruited to play on the all-European basketball team in Switzerland and came down with a disease, which I didn't know. I was sweating and going through all these. They didn't know what it was. Finally, they brought in an African doctor and they found out it was malaria that I had contracted while there in Nigeria. Of course, the residuals have not, have not affected me over the last year. So it was something that we were taught in the first Peace Corps group when I left, uh, when I went in in 63, which was the first time Kennedy said, what will you do for your country? Uh, for me, it was a new emerging kind of, of effort. My interest was always around civil and human rights. How do we change, how do we get into uh, voting rights and human rights and transportation rights and housing rights? And so it was not so much on an international, but not so much on a, a scale that was large, but uh, the way I got to Nigeria, they put me out of America. And sometimes when you face situations that are tough, you learn to grow. So in that situation, I began to appreciate different cultures. I began to appreciate different languages. I began to appreciate uh, how the political landscape began to, to change. So when I look now at the kinds of concerns that are going on, and I was there when the Biafra War broke out in 1966 between the Muslims in the north and the, and the Hausa in the west and the Igbos in the east. And we were there in the middle of all of that. And how do you begin to bring something together even though you're supposed to remain outside of it? So the question that she raised tonight, how do we break down those barriers? Our role when we went there is very much like what we're talking about tonight. The role in Nigeria at that time was a disease called kwashiorkor which was a deficiency of protein in the children's diet. And the, protein, and the uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, deficiency caused the, the uh, not rickets so much, but the bones to be deformed. So our role was to come in and try to convince people at the village level to infuse uh, more protein. And by that, it was going to be chicken farms and chicken eggs and all of these. So I found out, and I'll use that as an example to come into today's uh, question that was raised, is that one of the things where people cannot begin to communicate is when there is a tremendous amount of ignorance. I didn't say stupidity, but ignorance. Ignorance is when you just don't know. So one of the primary roles to get rid of ignorance, uh, and when ignorance is, it, it continues to grow and grow, fear crops up. And when you've got a fearful person who is ignorant, you've got a dangerous situation where no communication can occur. So if I were there now, it's the same way we did there, the same way we're doing here, in Mississippi and Alabama and places in America where there's ignorance and, and fear is to try to break down those barriers of ignorance by in a certain stage of enlightenment by information like the, the uh, things that we're talking about tonight. So to talk about mosquito nets and to talk about the various uh, uh, antiviral kinds of efforts that can go into for, for uh, malaria, I would first of all try to talk about how do I eradicate the ignorance, thereby lessen the fear once the fear is lessened, then I can move to something that's extremely important, communication. People, when they know better, they do better. So communication, but communication has to be predicated, I think, upon three things. One, I must understand you. Two, I must respect you. And three, I must trust you. So if we're to, uh, Sister Bialo, if we're to move ahead, we've got to set up uh, boundaries and channels of communication to alleviate the ignorance, to reduce the fear, to build the respect, to understand and establish the trust about what can happen and how we can alleviate uh, these, uh, these diseases at such an alarming rate. And I think that's, that's going to come by constantly uh, talking with people, respecting people, and not thinking that we know everything. A lot of this is not just throwing money at an issue. We've done that over the years all over the world, and that hasn't changed. But I think when people come in, people make the difference, and I think that that's what Medicare and Share and what what we're attempting to do. And I think that that's why 
the faith community has a tremendous amount uh, of importance because those of us who travel together in the Muslim and the Jewish community and the Christian community, we've had to alleviate our own ignorance and our own fear, the own myths about Muslims and about Jews and about Christians. And in doing that, if we can do this among ourselves, then I think we can be better uh, proclaimers of what it is that we have to do, talking about malaria and talking about other diseases. Uh, the guinea worm was a big one that Jimmy Carter worked with when I was with the Carter Project and other kinds of things. So, it, so I think alleviating the ignorance to reduce the fear, to bridge the communication so that we can have respect, understanding, and trust, then we can begin to infuse the kind of information where people will gravitate toward that and maybe we can make a difference if we don't give up and keep the faith. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I think that uh, going to Nigeria 
providing the, uh, the uh, needs for, for the people over there, not just in Nigeria, could be in Sierra Leone, could be in all these uh, countries that are actually in the equator uh, area, or tropical countries, in which we discover not just malaria, but also dengue and uh, yellow fever and other uh, diseases that can be prevented. Um, as I was exposed to malaria and to dengue, actually, in my, uh, in my, in my work, uh, going to a Christian place in, uh, in Honduras, uh, so the chlorokine had uh, the effect in my body as well. As well. Um, we understand what does it mean to be in the shoes of the other. And one we can reflect and mirror ourselves, the self, the self that we have inside us, in the reflection of the other who is looking at us, demanding justice for this world. We can understand that in faith, there's a lot to do through medicine. And each one of us has a responsibility. Every single person has a responsibility. As one of our rabbis said 2,000 years ago, and if not now, when? So that is my inspiration. I think that the, the bridge between the government and political issues, between religions that instead of separating us, has to bring us together, in order to bring cure for the people or prevention, education, turn down prejudices, uh, build up in trust, is what we all have to do and we have a responsibility for that. Thank you. <laughs> now we have a perspective from the media. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly concur with um, what Dr. Durley and what Rabbi Analia has said. And I would like to add to that, I think that for people who profess to worship the source of peace and who profess to worship the source of all good, it's really incumbent on us to be those things, to be peace and to be good. And as we've heard about two things that really motivate people or kind of cloud their actions sometimes, is our ignorance and fear. So for people of, who are believers, I believe that we have a responsibility to be a presence that dispels both ignorance and fear. And it's not enough for us to say that we are believers. It's not enough to say we believe in God and we worship one time a week or come to our congregations a few times a week. We actually have to put our faith into action. We have to be a presence of good. And so when we're thinking about helping others to move from that place of fear and ignorance, we ourselves have to be kind and patient and tolerant and accepting and understanding that our religious rituals whatever it is we're practicing, are but tools and means to get to God, to get to the level of God consciousness where we want to, to create a world of good. And I think that for so many thousands of years, right, we have been, uh, as human beings, living in a world where we think that power comes through conquering, coercing, and controlling. But really, truly, true power comes from cooperation and caring and concern. And so it's for us as people of faith to be able to change that, that paradigm and to have people understand that really we can cooperate and find power and progress through caring for each other. There's a verse in Quran that says, if you save the life of a human being, it is as if you would save the whole humanity. And this demonstrates our interconnectedness. And from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, you, do not, you are not a true believer until you want for your brother or your sister what you want for yourself. And so in a very egocentric society where we're thinking about I, and we're thinking about what really uh, satisfies ourselves, we need to think about others as well. I'm going to stop here. Okay.